All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Ray Majors Wildman. How are you doing, Ray? I am fabulous. How are you? <laughs> That's great. And Ray kind of calls herself the accidental entrepreneur, um, which I love that. And she's actually a neighbor of mine here, which is even nicer. I very, uh, don't often have people uh, that who are this close by here in North County, San Diego. But Ray's written a number of books, uh, The Juggling Act, a, se- a step-by-step guide to balancing your business and life. But the book I wanted to talk about today was the book, The Corporate Exodus, How America's Top Companies Attract and Develop the Next Generation of leaders, and I think you have a copy of the book there, Ray. If you want to show everybody available, I on do. yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so we were just talking momentarily uh, before we came on air about this issue that I think is facing a lot of organisations today. It's obviously attracting the next generation of leaders. But it's probably even made a little bit more complicated now because the next generation of leaders um, are from a different generation than the leaders who are maybe handing over the reins. And so there is maybe intergenerational um, misunderstandings or whatever. So um, so give us a little bit of background on the book in the first place, um, Ray, because I know it's interesting how you came to write this in the first place. Yes, you know, um, this book came about because when I was you know, really in bringing on new coaching and consulting clients, I had a lot of people wanting to start their business. And what I discovered is that these individuals were what I call corporate escape artists. They were leaving corporate because they were totally dissatisfied Mm -hmm. with how things were playing out. And it made me wonder, it's like, well, why are everybody leaving? And I actually went on this three-year research project where I went behind the scenes and interviewed some of the companies listed on the best places to work, like Amazon Mm -hmm. and and Zappos. and, And what I learned is that, you know, people don't, they don't quit jobs, they quit their boss. Right. Right. And so the average person, I think that the statistics was like over two million people per month quit their job. And I just realized, you know, if I can help organizations not only attract talent, but keep them happy, because everyone's not really cut out to be an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it would just make the world a better place. So that's how the book came about. And and it's interesting. I mean, those statistics are startling about the amount of people who leave their jobs. And and obviously, you know, we had a big recession in 2008. And um, I think a lot of mindsets changed and they haven't and they're not going back. I think a lot of people decided, well, why would I? Uh, locate myself close to a business, maybe in a high cost area, take on all that overhead. And then that business just lets me go and I'm stuck in that. So why don't I go live where I want to live and find a business that will either um, either locally there or one that will allow me to work remotely? Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, think about it. Like I'm originally from Detroit mm-hmm. and both my parents were factory workers. So I'm I'm the accidental entrepreneur. I started my business and my mom was like, you're being irresponsible. You need to go find a job. Because when they were growing up, in the workforce, they were taught, you go find a company, they're going to be loyal to you, you're going to work there for 30 years, get that gold watch. Well, that's not the case anymore. You know, a lot of people find that companies are not as loyal as they used to be. And so now we're seeing not only I increase uh, people starting their own business, but you also see what we call like the gig economy, yep. where people are doing Uber and um, and Lyft and all these other things in order to create the lifestyle that they want. And so you have found that the, the that for those people who do want to join companies or are attracted to join companies and stay there, because I think there's also people are are, are even more comfortable with job hopping than they even used to be. I think um, what you said, culture plays a huge role in that decision. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I went behind the scenes and I interviewed the companies, I was looking for what is the common thread? And the number one thing that all of these companies had was a winning culture. And I think that's the key word, because a lot of times when people think of like Google Mm -hmm. or when they think of Zappos, they think of, well, you know, Ray, we want to create this dynamic culture, but we can't afford to have all of these perks. Right. And they just assume that people are or these companies are just giving their their 
people free food and free whatever. But these people are getting it based on production. Mm -hmm. And that that's the key difference is that they're creating an environment where people want to win, that it's more entrepreneurial, which people love. Um, and that's what's making their, especially the millennials, happy because they get to kind of create a job within the organization. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And, I, and I've seen that kind of firsthand, what you're talking about, where people even try to replicate what they think the model is like, you know, they put in a foosball table or they put in a massage chair. And for about a month, everybody's excited. They're playing it. And then it just sits there and collects dust because that's not really it doesn't right. really have any long term impact. But let's explore a little bit more because you're saying like the millennials like to get the opportunity to create their job. I mean, why why is that so important to them? Because traditionally, you know, as you know, when you hire people, they wanted to know what's on my job description and can you make it as detailed as possible because I really need to know. Now it seems a little a lot more fluid. Right. I think what's happening with millennial is that, you know, they call them the entitled generation mm -hmm. and a lot of that. I mean. It's true, but I hate to stereotype anybody. Yeah. And to be honest, it's, I, it's probably our fault. We've created, I mean. It's our fault. Yeah. <laughs> I have two of them. I yeah, know. exactly. So right. we've, made, we've made them entitled. <laughs> exactly. But I think the thing is, is that they want to they wanna chart their own course. They, mm -hmm. they want to be able to think outside of the box. I remember I was interviewing this one company, and it was um, Red Door Media out of San Diego, as a matter of fact. And they had this dynamic... Um, just culture. And one of the things that I asked the, the CEO, is like, you have such a great team. Like, what is it that really is, is, is drawing them to you? And he used an example of one of his top creative directors. He mentioned the fact that this guy, he's very creative, but he loves soccer. Mm -hmm. And so what they did is they, they created this, um, this arrangement where it's like, you can go play soccer every day. And from two to four, he would leave work. And then he would come back and he would work till eight o'clock. And he's like a loyal fan of the company because he has that flexibility. And I think that's what the millennials are looking for is how can I bring my gifts, my talents, my skills, and how can I in infuse them into the organization? And can I work for a company that will allow me to have that flexibility and that adaptability so that I can create the lifestyle that I want? Because I just don't want to sit behind the, mm -hmm. the four walls all day, if that makes sense. No, and it, it totally makes sense. And that has been, I mean, our experience as an organization, you know, we we ourselves at Pipeliner strive to not have offices when we don't need them unless there's a really good reason for them. We prefer people to have the flexibility to be where they need to be and to have a wider pool of talent as a result. Um, I guess, though, the for some of the people listening, they say that's all well and good, but... Um, it's great to provide this flexibility to people, but how can you ensure then that you get the that you get the responsibility and accountability in return? So it's not just people taking advantage. Oh, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. Because to me, you know, one of the things that I know is that, you know, you have to have accountability. Mm -hmm. And that's where entitlement comes from. It's where you don't have that accountability. So if you are having staff that's remote, it's like what systems and processes can you put in place? It could be, you know, for example, we're doing the Skype um, mm -hmm. chat. It could be that our meetings are on Skype and, you know, we're going to meet at a certain time. Maybe every day we do a huddle. So that way everybody's on the same page. We're doing it via video so people can connect and see each other eyeball to mm -hmm. eyeball. But I think it really does. You know, it's a, a sense of creating that empowerment. But if you don't hold them accountable, then it's almost like um, you're 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 letting the inmate out, <laughs> right, <laughs> to do the thing, right? So accountability is really the key to allowing people um, just the opportunity to to grow. And and I think the the biggest piece is accountability and not micromanagement mm -hmm. because no one likes to be micromanaged. Right. Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that completely. And I think, um, and I think my, my personal philosophy on micromanagement is if I have to micromanage somebody, then I don't need them because I might as well just do the job myself. And um, you want to be able to have people who can, you know, feel empowered and take a job and, and run with it. Um, so what are what are some of the other, um, as we're looking to build the next generation of, of leaders, what are some of the other things that we should be looking out for or, or how we can create the conditions to find for the right people to come through? 
You know, you mentioned something before, and I just want to bring it back to the mm -hmm. forefront, because this is probably one of the few times in our country's history, well, I would even say the world's history, where you have three, soon to be four generations working in mm -hmm. the workforce, right? right? So you have the boomers, and if you think about the theme of the boomers, they're all about respect, they're all about work hard, you know, that's that's kind of the model. And then you have the Gen X, which is all about work-life balance, right? And then you have the millennials and then Gen Z. Mm -hmm. And so I think as organizations, it's so important that we take the 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 intellectual properties or the wisdom of the boomers. And we allow the boomers to infuse that wisdom into our young people. And then vice versa. I think it's important as we are older adults that we realize that the millennials and the younger generation bring so much just knowledge, especially when it comes to technology. Mm -hmm. So I think the more we can marry those two, the more you're going to see that A, the next generation feels respected because everyone wants to feel respected, sure. you know, and B, we're not allowing our boomers to retire without transferring that wealth of knowledge. Yeah. And I think you picked up on a fascinating point. And, um, you know, as I always say to, to my, to my 14 year old son, I said, well, I'm, I'm too old to know everything. You know, you need, <laughs> you need to be, you need to be your age to know everything. Um, but I think it's a really interesting point is that, that, that mutual respect, because I know, I mean, a lot of the younger people complain, oh, well, we're not respected. People see us as entitled, but then in return, they don't always respect the people who have the dinosaurs like ourselves who belong to another <laughs> thing. And the fact that we do have some wisdom. So I like that idea of how do you, how do you create that mutual respect where you can get the best of both worlds? Mm -hmm. It's almost like cross pollination, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, you know, we can create like, um, like depending on the size of a company, right? So mm -hmm. I think you should always have some kind of advisory board. And if you can mm -hmm. mix like the youth with the, the older generation so that they can brain share and have a think tank and say, okay, what are some best practices we can bring into the organization? And I think by creating that, that's where you, you see that synergy and that mutual respect starts to kind of build. Yeah, I, I and I think that's a really good point for people to take away. I think that uh, uh, intergenerational uh, or cross generational um, advisory board is is a really good idea. Um, and then, I mean, I guess the other part is we were talking about, uh, you know, the way there's a different approach from the generations coming through. Uh, how do we? How are we going to? understand and develop their leadership style because that's going to be different from maybe my leadership style or other people of, of a different generation and how do we recognize that because that's always the toughest thing is when you because you know we naturally sort of think this is the way you should do it and if somebody comes along and doing something radical you know maybe very differently it's kind of hard for us to to adjust or even see that as a different approach what, what do you think about the leadership how leadership styles will be different in the future yeah, you know, it's interesting because if you think about, like, if you go back to, I would say, even the 60s, the 70s, maybe the 80s, it was, it was kind of this authoritarian leadership mm -hmm. style where it's like, you do what I say, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like, or else. It was, mm -hmm. It's more fear-based, right? But I think the leaders of today are going to be the leaders that are more authentically based. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to be, you know, I love Clint Kim Blanchard. He has a mm -hmm. situational leadership model. So I think it's looking at how can our youth become more transformational leaders, um, more authentic leaders, because that is what people are, are drawn to. If we look at social media, I mean, that's a perfect example. When organizations first jumped on the social media, they were trying to do the marketing like the old. Right. And what they realized is social media is all about authenticity. So I think it's about you know, teaching people that really um, what the millennials respect is in a leader who is open, who is honest, not perfect, right? You know, they're able to share their flaws. Uh, Steve Jobs was a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. And so as we're allowing them to adapt this either transformational or authentic leadership style, what I think is not only is it going to resonate with, you know, them bringing on people up under them, them getting the respect of people who went before them, but I think it's just going to be a different way of how we view the world 
when it comes to leaders. Yeah, and I think um, and what you're talking about there obviously kind of brings us full circle then to to culture, right? Because I mean that is uh, culture obviously takes a lot of its cues from the leadership and the way the company is managed. So I guess the the um, the culture will be very important and a reflection of the way the leader leads. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And what I discovered when I was writing the book is that there are actually four cultures that I came across. Um, the first culture was like a level one where it was all about, you know, I'm here to get a paycheck. And we see that like with retail, fast sure. food. Um, level two is all about us versus them. So it's management versus the employee. Mm -hmm. Level three is a winning culture because it's typically you have the rock stars, but they're versing the, you know, kind of like the crabs in the bucket mentality. Mm -hmm. It's like, why they, oh, they think they're better than me. So you <laughs> find, you see that in fighting. It's very profitable as an organization. But to me, I think the the culture that we want to strive for is level four, where it's together we win. And mm -hmm. it's where you take on that. It's almost like a mission for the organization to make the world a better place. And if you can get to that level four culture, you know, it's, it's funny because there is a progression and you'll see people go bouncing back and forth. Mm -hmm. But if you can make it there, then what you'll find is that, um, people are going to want to stay because right. they're invested not just in the organization, but something bigger than the organization. But in order, obviously in order to achieve that level four, then you have to, ha you, it has to be where everybody in the organization feels that their contribution matters. Right. Uh, and, and that's, that can be a, that can be a tough thing to, to, to create. Right. It could be if you want it to be mm -hmm. right. Because it really comes down to trust. And if I'm hiring someone, right, you know, I think it's Jim Collins that said that our goal is to get the right people on the bus, the mm -hmm. wrong people off the bus and the right people in the right seats. Mm -hmm. So if that's truly our mission, then we need to trust that the people that we have on the bus, if they're in the right seat, that they're going to be contributing. And sometimes it's hard because leaders are the ones that really will muff stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it, it really starts for the, I, I kind of say from the head down, it's mm -hmm. like, what is the culture that they're wanting to create? It doesn't mean that you can't lead from without a title. I think you can, but I think it becomes very challenging if you want to bring contribution and you're not, your contribution is not appreciated mm -hmm. or welcomed by those in charge. And I think one, um, one last point on, on this is, and I'd like to get your insight into this, is that I think there's a lot of people in leadership and there's a lot of companies out there who they don't have a deliberate culture. They have an organic, they have a culture that has grown organically or accidentally or whatever. Um, talk to me a little bit about, I mean, obviously you can go that route, but you're kind of, uh, you know, leaving it up to fate. So, I mean, how much do leaders have to really take a step back for a moment and really examine and say, what is the culture of my organization today and what do I really want it to be? I think it's critical. I think it's essential. And I agree. You know, people, there's times when I'm going in an organization, they bring me in for consulting and they say, mm -hmm. well, we really don't have a culture, right? I was <laughs> like, no, you have a culture. <laughs> You might not have deliberately or intentionally created it, mm -hmm. but if I go to the water cooler, I can tell what the culture is, right? right? If I go to the kitchen and find out what people are saying, I can definitely understand that. And so for me, I think it's essential that those that are in charge, that they take the time away, whether it's them going on a three-day retreat away from the day-to-day -day operation, to really sit down and say, what is it that we, or how do we want this company to evolve in? And if you don't do that, then you're going to show what's going to show up is what you get. But the sad part about it is, is that if you're not intentional and deliberate with your culture, you could keep bringing in good people. They're not going to stay. Right. You're going to have that revolving door. Yeah, no, that's a great point. A great point to end on. But before we go, Ray, I'd like you to tell the people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you. Oh, absolutely. So I am so passionate about helping organizations really create a winning culture, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so for your listeners, they can find me at my website at Ray Majors Wildman International. And what I do is consulting and executive coaching and really helping not only develop emerging leaders, but helping the leaders in charge create a culture that they absolutely love. 
Yeah. Well, listen, thanks very much, Ray. And as uh, as our viewers and, and listeners can tell, you are very passionate about this subject. So I would highly recommend that they go and check you out. Uh, Ray Majors Wildman, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeline of CRM. See you all again soon. Bye. <laughs>